So we're in Romans, we're being continuing our series in, in Romans, we're in Romans chapter 5. So we're just kind of going again through verse by verse through the book, taking a chapter every week. And so as we get to chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1, and it says, Therefore, now I don't know if you've all heard every preacher who always says, when you see therefore, you have to ask, why is the therefore there? Or in other words, in light of, why is that there? So it's referring back to basically everything that's been going on in the first four chapters, what his main points is. And in fact, if you go back to, uh, to chapter 4 in verse uh, 13 through 15, because this is a, a recurring theme that he just keeps hitting, and sometimes people go, okay, we've got it, you know. But it says, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heirs of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. And then in, in chapter 3, uh, in verse 21 through 23, it kind of repeats that same thing. It says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. So he keeps going on this same theme. And here we are in chapter 5, and he's going to continue on with it in verse 1. And he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. Again, hitting that, that theme. It's through faith. It's through the grace of God. It's not through our works. Through faith in Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice <clears throat> in the hope of the glory of God. But he says we have peace with God through our Lord. That's interesting he uses that term, we have peace with God. Now that's different than... Uh, the peace of God. The peace of God, uh, if you want to turn over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, talks about that. I'll just read it for you. And as Paul's writing to the Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's the peace of God. But the peace with God, you need to think about that, that, that you were never neutral. You were either for God or you were against Him. And a lot of times we think, well, I wasn't against God. Yes, but if you, if you had not received Him, you are at enmity, or the Scripture says, at war with God. We were never neutral. So there's only two types of people. Those who have been justified by faith by believing and those who have not. And it's interesting that all religion, other, all other religions, is about trying to work your way to God, 
attempt to reach God through works. And it's all about really about you, what you're doing, rather than receiving the grace of God and what He has done. So the focus becomes on ourselves rather upon the one whose righteousness we've been made righteous by. You know, it is said that Martha Luther, Martin Luther, that he preached justification and grace every week because he said the people forget. And if you remember back, of course, that was a time when, when uh, the Catholic Church was the a, was a one religion and how they used to have uh, penance, People would pay, people would do some crazy things, indulgence to gain favor with God. And it's almost like working for your salvation. I mean, they do some crazy things. Even today, you see like in the Philippines, every year, to be somebody who gets crucified. Crucify themselves because they want to be closer to the Lord. You know, and they did some weird things like they would travel miles and miles to go to Rome on their knees you know, as a way to justify, to make themselves worthy of the Lord. And so it's all about man's attempt to reach God. And so Martin Luther felt like he needed to continually break that cycle because there's something within us that says, we must do something. I'm, I must do something to, for my salvation. And... It's all about Jesus and what he did for you. And so anything that we do, we do it because we're grateful to that gratification that we are grateful for what the Lord has done to us, for us. So we have to stand in that grace. And in Paul's day, of course, one of the main issues he was working with was, again, the Judaizers who were saying, no, you need to follow the Torah, you need to follow uh, the law in order for you to really be saved. And he's continually butting up against that, fighting against it. All right, I'm going to look at uh, verse 2. Through whom we have access, gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So this morning, on the way into church, Nathan and Brittany had a really bad fight this morning on the way in. And I'm sorry Azrael had to be there. But, so what's, what, what does the accuser of the brethren do? Well, Brittany, you're a worship leader. How can you? How, Nathan, you're an elder. You're, you're one of the teachers, and you're just nothing but a hypocrite. So there's that enemy right there whispering in the ear, or maybe it goes back to some major sin or what we consider a major sin in our past that was years ago, wants to bring that back up. And uh, who do you think you are? How can you say you're a Christian? You know what you did. And so the enemy is always there speaking those lies, trying to get us back to come under that accusation. And that's where we always have to turn and say it's only by the grace of God, the accuser of the brethren. Now, as I say that, I just want to remind you all that there is a ditch on both sides. So on one side, there is that legalism that you get into works, trying to perform. And again, it's not about your performance. Our performance is always going to be short. It's never going to be good enough. There's only one who was good enough. And it's because of his blood that we have that righteousness. But on the other hand, and you're going to see probably next week in chapter 6, Nathan would be bringing this up, but how many times people would misinterpret Paul's teaching to twist it to say, well, well, if that's the case, if it's by grace that we are saved, 
and nothing of ourself, then I'm, I'll just live like I want to live. I'll just do what I want to do. I'll just sin because his grace abounds more. And he says, no, that is not what I'm saying. Say, no, you, because of what's been done, we live a life of gratitude, of righteousness, trying to please God, not knowing that it adds to our salvation, but because we want to be pleasing, we want to please him, we want to be in fellowship with him. And so it, it is a tension. You know, it, it says that truth is often held in attention. Both sides are true. But if you have someone who uh, says they're a brother, they're a Christian, and yet they're living in obvious, blatant sin, then, and if they don't feel any conviction, then I think there's something probably wrong there. Because usually Christians make lousy sinners because they feel that conviction. And so the, the thing to do is always to run towards the Lord and not away from Him. Now, our natural tendency is we sin is that we want to hide. We, you know, we want to run the opposite direction. But instead, we should be running to the Lord, knowing that he is faithful, that if we're quick to repent, he's quick to forgive. And his love never changes. He loves you when you were sinners. So how much more now? But sometimes we feel like he can't love me now. He loves you. As long as you continue to believe, to believe what has been done on your behalf, it's about faith in the grace that's been given to us. All right, so verse 3 through 5 says, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So there's a, a progression. Now, I'm still working on the uh, rejoicing of that <clears throat> You know, rejoice in your suffering, but there, is a, but there is a reality in that, that as you begin to mature, it's like uh, if you're working out, say you're working out with weights, that resistance builds strength. And so if you ever notice, sometimes people will get, get first get saved, and it's like every prayer they pray, the Lord just answers like that. And it's like, man, this is great. But then as they begin to walk with the Lord a little more, all of a sudden, sometimes the prayers don't seem to be answered the same way. And it's because the Lord is saying, okay, now it's time for you to begin to grow in faith, to begin to mature. And so what was so easy before becomes resistance, but the resistance builds our faith. So it's really a good thing. But again... As far as rejoicing, I'm still working on that one. Okay, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely would anyone die for the righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, it's interesting when it talks about when the time had fully come. I always kind of wondered, you know, why, why did the Lord come at that specific time? Why was that even important? Uh, in Galatians... Four. I just want to look over real quickly at that. In verse 4 and 5. It says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So at the fullness of time, he sent his son who was under law, under that old system, to redeem us and bring about the new covenant. But the thing to remember is that when we were yet sinners, when we were at enmity with the Lord, he loved us. He first loved us. So how much more without love now that you are in the faith? And verse 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Let's just stop right there for a second. If we have been justified by his blood, we've been saved from God's wrath. Because God is love, but God is also just. And his justice must be satisfied. So when there is a failure, which every single one of us, every human except for Jesus, failed, someone had to pay that price. Someone had to step in your place and take that punishment that you and I would have and remove the wrath that would be coming upon us. And so we have this, this parallel where, where where the Lord is love, and yet he is also just. Justice has to be served, and through his love, through that plan he had for eternity, he brought his son to take our place. So we've been justified. That's huge. Verse 10, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. So we've been reconciled with God by the blood of Jesus. And that was the only way it could happen. Because in that way, God does his law. You know, the, the law says, if you break any of the commandments, you're guilty of them all. And so sometimes we have a hierarchy of what we think is the worst and, and what's the lighter commandments. But if you broke one, you are guilty. And we were all guilty again. We were helpless. You know, we, we're never going to, in this life, achieve moral perfection. We're going to stumble at times. But we have to realize that God is there for us. Again, if we repent quickly, run towards him, he's there to love us, to take in his arms, and we are assured of that. And then in verse 12, he starts to this, this series where he's going to compare Adam, the first Adam, to Jesus. So he says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, of course, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a commandment as Adam did, who was a pattern of the one to come. But if the gift is not like the trespass, 
For if many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man's death reigned through that one, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. So those of us who have received that, that God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life. So it's just comparing again that we were born in sin. We have all failed. We all come from that seed of Adam. But now in Christ, we are truly a new creation. And again, that doesn't mean that we are going to live in perfection. We are going to stumble. God doesn't want us to stumble. And I think we also have to realize, you know, as we talk about forgiveness and we talk about the, you know, God's love towards us is not changed but because of our performance. But at the same time, we have to realize that there is a principle of sowing and reaping. So many times... We, when we sow to the flesh, then there is a reaping. It doesn't mean that God stopped loving us. It doesn't mean that we lost our salvation. It just means because of sowing and reaping, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be things that make, make life more difficult, okay, that the Lord would rather us not have to go through. But it doesn't change His love, and it doesn't change your salvation. You're secure in Christ as long as you continue to believe in faith, who he is and what he has done for you. Okay, verse 20. It says, The law was added so that trespasses might increase. In other words, he's saying trespasses are in the world. People were already sinning, but until there was a written law, how could it be, you know, if something was not against the law at the time you were speeding, and now they changed it, and you previously had been speeding, but it wasn't against the law at that time, then there's no guilt. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the purpose of the law, okay, if we look back in Romans 3.20, it tells us that no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Okay? So it's through the law that we become conscious of what sin is. We know, again, that no one has ever, except Jesus, walked perfectly. Even if you boil down the, the law and the prophets to what New Testament says, love your, well, to love the Lord your God with all your strength, all your might, and all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself, we still fail at that. Now, in Galatians 3.19, I'm going to read that real quickly for you. Three nineteen. 
And it says clearly, it says, What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred has come. So the purpose of the law was added because of transgression until the seed, and, and there you go back to Abraham's seed, where it was singular and not plural, meaning Jesus, until that time it was fulfilled. I had a, there were some notes uh, in the ESV version about verse 520. I just want to read what it said. It said, the, the typical Jewish view in Paul's day was that God gave a law to counteract the sinful impulses of humans. In Judaism, there was a proverb, the more Torah, the more life. But Paul points out that the law came in to increase the trespasses, probably in the sense that once people had written a written law from God, they committed not just a sin against God's law in their conscience, but even more seriously, willfully transgressed against a clear spoken command directly from God. So as we, we work through that, and all, again, all through the first five chapters of Romans, again, he keeps hitting that, that same theme, that we can add nothing to our salvation. It's all about Christ and not about us. It's what he has done for us. And we need to always see that clearly. You know, as long as we choose to have believing loyalty to Jesus, we are secure in him. Again, it's not about your performance. It's not about where you failed. It's your believing loyalty, believing in who he is, who he said he is, and what he did on your behalf. But at the same time, just because someone said a prayer, let's say, 20 years ago, but no longer believes, that person is not in the kingdom of God. And so we walk in this kind of, this kind of tension of, of knowing that, that God wants us to live holy lives, pleasing to him. But it's very easy for us to kind of switch over and, and switch into a performance-based mentality where we have got to produce something. We have got to have good works in order to gain his favor, in order to gain, to add to our salvation. And it's all about, again, him and what he did. And it's about his grace that was poured out on our behalf. And, and reading through all this, it should get you to the point where you are just so grateful for what he has done. That he took upon himself our sins, your sins, my sins, carried him to the cross, nailed him to the cross, that we receive that forgiveness, that grace that only he could give us. And because of him, we have eternal life with him. And that we are eternally secure with him as long as we continue to believe, to have faith in what he has done for us. And not try to add a certain set of works or standard to reach what you think you should and we should. We should be, because the Lord, you know, he, he continues over and over, encourages us to live a godly, holy life. But again, it's because of gratitude. It's because of that thankfulness that's in our heart for what he has done for us. And so it's a, it can be easily twisted where it becomes about you working and you adding to. And so there is a little twist in that you have to be careful of. 
But for us to live holy, pleasing lives, yes, that is something the Lord wants us to do. Just don't twist it to be about your works. It's all about him and what he has done for us. So, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, as we go through this book of Romans and we see what has been done on our behalf, Lord, even though we were not faithful, Lord, you were faithful. Lord, you loved us first. Lord, you laid down your life for us. You have brought us justification. When we were guilty, Lord, you stepped in. And you, know, you brought a way for us to be reconciled unto you, Father, by the death of the Son. And so, Lord, we are so grateful, so thankful for what you have done on our behalf. So, Lord, we ask for your grace, your help, Lord, to keep us on the path of life. Lord, to keep us out of the ditch that's on both sides of the road. Lord, we would walk straight towards you, Lord, with our eyes lifted and our eyes upon you and what you have done for us. So, Lord, I just ask that you would just encourage your people today. Lord, that you would build them up, that they are secure in your love, that you will never fail us, that you are always faithful. Though every man be a liar, Lord, you are faithful and you are true. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through the Son. So, Lord, we thank you again afresh and anew. It's just like when we take communion. And, Lord, we know what the body was broken on our behalf and the blood that was shed on our behalf. We never get tired of that, Lord. We never want to treat it as a, uh, Lord, just going through a ritual, but, Lord, that that has been done on our behalf. So, Lord, we ask for your continued reminders of who we are in you, Lord, and what you have done for us. And we thank you, Lord, and we give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. If we can have a song, anyone who would like prayer for anything, whether it's healing, whether whatever is going on, feel free to come forward, and uh, we will pray, get something to share, or if you have a word you'd like to share, now is the time.